um, last week we did substrate and nutrient uh, requirement of the plant. So we basically talked about root zone environment. And this week we are going to do a little bit more physiology, you know, classic physiological plant physiology concepts. Today, water relation, a water potential. Um, and Wednesday, we are going to talk about uh, uh, translocation sink source relationship. So um, it's very important, you know, the water movement and also photosynthesis carbon allocation. So it, we are getting a good understanding of whole, whole plant physiology, basically. Um, so the last week um, after the substrate, so that Wednesday, there was a question about how substrate pH affects uh, nutrient solution pH or how nutrient solution pH affects substrate pH. That's depending on, depending on the volume. So if you have huge amount of nutrient solution going into the small volume of substrate, substrate pH wouldn't have much effect. But um, if the substrate volume is large, like strawberry, and a uh, very small amount of nutrient is coming in, then substrate pH is more dominating than nutrient pH. That's why I guess in a soil production system, you pay attention on the soil pH, but not so much on water pH. You don't really adjust water pH for doing um, soil-based production. But if you are doing hydroponic, substrate pH is small for high wire production system like tomato, high wire production, meaning plants are tall, big canopy, small substrate root zone. And then in that case, what you are giving is what plants are affected. Same thing for the pond system, right? Pond system, um, uh, uh, the roots are in the nutrient solution. Therefore, of course, the pH of the nutrient solution affects the water uptake and everything. It's just, so it's, it's relative depending on the system. OK, um, so here you go. Today. Um, water relation. Water relation is very important concept. So this is just a review. Um, so you probably have more opportunities to learn water relation um, in um, uh, plant physiology course as well as um, soil water environmental science. Um, soil, soil science probably and then also um, environmental physics maybe ecophysiology um, if there is one in, in your way. So anyway, um, today we have one reference um, reading material. This is coming from this book chapter. Um, it's only 20 pages or so, so uh, it's not challenging. But I, I want you to, to read if you are not familiar with this concept, because again, this is an overview. Um, I, as usual, I try to break down so that it's easy to understand, so that giving you essence, um, uh, but deep understanding you really need to read. Okay, um, so that chapter is basically water, water environment. Um, there you go. Okay, so um, we talked a lot about um, stomates, stomata. And that's the exit of moisture, right, um, to the air from the plant system. And within the plant system, you know that, you know, the water is in the liquid phase. And then evaporate, so the vapor phase um, going out. Entrance is, uh, is the roots, right? The plant roots is the entrance for the water coming, water coming up uh, into the, the plant system. So the balance of the two is very important, right? How much water is coming um, from the roots or absorbed by the roots or surface of the roots and how much water is uh, evaporating from the leaf surfaces, right? Balance of the two. So if you compare those two, you can actually uh, find out the status, you know, steady state status, which is completely balanced. The same amount of water evaporated you know, compared to the amount of water absorbed by the plants. But under certain conditions, 
Transpiration, which is evaporation from the plant system. Transpiration might exceed the water uptake from the roots, right? And in some occasion, transpiration may be very much suppressed, like the high humidity conditions or no light. And then, but still, water is taken up passively. Um, we call root pressure, but it's a passive action. Water trying to come into the plant system. Um, so the, some occasions, you know, the, so the comparison is, is opposite. So the absorption rate probably exceeds the transpiration rate. But that doesn't probably continue because Targa gets, you know, maximum pressure, um, the xylem system, maximum pressure, and then sort of push the water back. So it's a balancing eventually. But anyway, so, um, so if you want to talk about, for example, uh, water stress, um, you can easily tell that water stress of the plants happen under the condition of the first one, right? Transpiration exceeding the water uptake rate from the roots. So when that, that is the case, plants sense water stress and then try to regulate the transpiration rate. How? Closing or adjusting stomata opening, right? So that's what that's what plants do. Okay, so it's very simple, right? We 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 understand plants. We know this regulation. All right. So water stress can be caused by the conditions um, inducing the uh, you know higher transpiration rate than water absorption rate. And an example conditions I mentioned was um, high humidity or no, the other way, high vapor pressure deficit, so the low humidity, big capacity for the air to take up the water vapor, therefore more, vent more transpiration going on. Maybe net radiation is high, so that incoming energy is high, therefore plants need to transpire to you know, balance out the energy or the consume the energy, uh, cool down. So in that situation, plants are under the conditions driving tra big transpiration rate. And that's the condition you probably see um, potentially wilting when you know, the amount of water plants can absorb from the roots um, is limited. And then also, the water in the root zone is not pure water. So it contains salts, right? So that means movement of the water you know, uptake of water from the root zone to the plant system may be sometimes restricted. Even the water is there, for example, salty water, um, high salt concentrations, then in that case, water is difficult to get absorbed by the plants. Under the situation, that kind of situation, you may have, again, transpiration rate exceeding the water uptake rate. And then in that case, you may see plants under water stress and start closing stomata, or the worst scenario, it starts wilting. Wilting happens when water loss is too much and losing targar. Targar is the you know, positive pressure to support plant body. So basically, you know, plants are swollen and then supporting. If, you, if the plants lose that targar, then just wilt, right? Can't support the structure. It's like a balloon, right? Okay, um, and uh, water stress sometimes equally used as a synonym as drought stress, but drought stress and water stress is not exactly the same because drought stress is basically lack of water in the root zone. So the water content in the root zone is, is low, therefore drought. Water stress could be because of the drought or because of the high salt concentration. So the water is difficult to move from root zone to the plant. So that's, that's, you know, that's the case limiting the water uptake. And then when transpiration exceeding, exceeding that, then you see the uh, water stress. But if transpiration is reduced, for example, um, I have a high concentration of salts in the nutrient solution. And if I don't anything, let the plants go, then plants are definitely under water stress, that high salt concentration. Um, 
if I can't change the concentration of salts, what I can do to avoid the water stress is reduce the transpiration. And plants probably want to, you know, reduce the transpiration and might want to try to reduce the stomata opening. But I can also help the plants by reducing the light intensity, net radiation. So that transpiration is going to be reduced, therefore plants don't get water stress or wilt. So, so it's, it's all about balance, transpiration and water uptake. Okay, so to understand that movement, water moving from the soil to the roots, root to the um, stem through the xylem, and also the, the, through the xylem from the stem to the leaf and leaf to the air. So that whole system, plant system movement, including atmosphere, including root zone, um, to understand that, we can use the concept of water potential. How many of you have never had water potential at all? Okay, so um, water potential is basically the concept to explain the water movement and basically the energy status of the water. So moving into from point A to point B. Okay, so understanding water potential and components of the water potential help you to understand what is the potential moving direction and what is the driving force likely in that whole system. Um, the water molecule is connected, so the capillary action, and then therefore, if there is one driving force, for example, putting water from the leaf in a big force, and then the, the transpiration rate is driven by that force, even though in individual you know, difference in terms of water potential or movement potential is very small in the stem and roots and root zone. But if there is a big you know, pulling force somewhere because everything is connected, therefore it's, it's basically pulled. Um, but anyway, so um, the first part of this lecture is basically for you to review water potential and what it is. Okay, so the water potential um, concept um, uh, uh, in, induced, introduced by those scientists. Oh, back in 1960s. Um, water potential is a proportional to the difference between the chemical potential, basically energy status of water, chemical energy status of water, and then has a reference value, which is a pure water, okay? So that it's always pure water as zero water potential. Okay, and then um, it's all relative, so it could be negative, it could be positive. Um, and then the big, big um, uh, concept you need to understand is water moves from the point having high water potential to lower, uh, to low water potential. It's like a diffusion, high to low, high water potential, low water potential. Water potential could be negative, and in plant system, usually most of the time it's negative value. Okay, so high to low is interpreted as less negative to more negative. Okay, less negative to more negative. Um, and the uh, driving force of water movement is water potential gradient. So how much difference exists in that particular section of the, you know, the root plant and atmosphere system is the driving force. However, it's a driving force, therefore it might be, you know, um, limited because of the huge resistance exists. For example, big water potential difference between, let's say, um, uh, leaf and air. Okay, air can, has, uh, air can have water potential too, based on the humidity level, right? So the air and leaf big water potential difference, so there is a big driving force, but when stomata closed, then huge resist, uh, resistance, right? So that means actual transpiration or actual moving um, rate of the water is depending on the gradients or water potential difference, and then also resistance or conductance between the two um, uh, you know, points you are looking at. Okay, um, so it's, it's, it's exactly like diffusion. Um, and the unit of water potential is Pascal. It's a pressure unit. 
So sometimes you get confused because of BPD, vapor pressure deficit, is a kilopascal, it's the same pascal unit, right? Um, but water potential also use pressure unit, and the order is usually megapascal, you, you are talking about in a plant system, megapascal unit. And then those are not the same values, even though using the same unit, but not the same value. So you're not gonna, you know, do those values together. Um, and then again, water potential of pure water is defined as zero pascal as a reference point, and uh, most of others are usually negative, ex except the pressure potential. Um, like a turgor. Turgor is a pressure potential, so the pressure is added to squeeze the water or resist to the water um, movement, and that is a pressure potential having a positive value. All right. Okay, so in a plant system, water potential is pretty much um, uh, uh, broken down into three big components. Um, actually four, but I, I put this in a small, uh, because usually this is um, ignored. Um, so one is osmotic potential. It's coming from osmosis, right? Osmosis is coming from the salts, you know, the concentration. Um, osmotic pressure. So um, high osmotic pressure or high osmosis, that means more negative water potential, osmotic potential, okay? If the value is high in osmosis, then your um, water potential gets more negative, okay? Um, pressure potential, um, it's, a, it's a pressure basically added to the system to squeeze water you know, from A to B. Um, so the turgor is one example in the plant system. Matrix potential, it's due to the matrix pressure. It's, it's a, a absorption, like a sponge, or the surface of porous material, soil, substrate. You know, if you have pure water and substrate attached, water is sucked by the substrate, okay? Um, so that's a matrix potential. Um, in, a, in, a, in a plant cell, we have some matrix potential exists, but it's very small. So it's very difficult to measure, if I understand correct. Um, another one is the gravitational potential. So the water, for example, water column, high position and low position, water moves from you know, top to down, and that's a gravitational potential. But in a plant system, usually, the water potential difference is very small region, you know, we are, looking at, for example, leaf and air that, you know, across the boundary layer. So it's really gravitational potential is ignorable, you know. So that's why we don't really pay too much attention um, in uh, gravitational potential in a plant system. Okay, all right. Um, so that why the unit of potential, water potential, is a pressure unit, Pascal. Um, so. I said water potential is the chemical energy per volume of water, and so the energy per volume of water is basically joule per cubic meter of water. And then the energy is expressed also with Newton meter, you know, how much force and then how much, you know, uh, so one meter of movement, therefore that's the energy, you know, one, one Newton, Newton uh, uh, to, uh, of power and then uh, to move one meter of distance. So that's the energy required to do that action. So you can subtract joule with um, a Newton meter and then the, if you uh, clean up the dimension and then it, it gets to Newton, New, Newton per square meter and that's basically force per square meter of area, so that's the pressure. So that's why you can change to Pascal. So, so it's energy per volume of water, but because of that dimensional analysis, we, we use Pascal as a, as a sort of um, conventional unit um, used for water potential. Um, and then uh, um, all the literature, you might see bar, B-A-R, and then this is a conversion, one megapascal equal 10 bar. So if somebody is talking about bar, you just need to divide by 10 to get megapascal, okay? All right, so um, uh, some review. Um, so this is a sort of channel, okay? Um, 
and then divided the two um, sections by um, semi-permeable membrane, okay? Um, solids cannot go through, but water can go through, semi-permeable membrane. And then your left-hand side is pure water, and right-hand side is sucrose water, sucrose-containing water. And then you know that osmosis, osmotic pressure, um, uh, which is very high, you know, high osmotic pressure in the sucrose containing water and low osmotic pressure uh, in the pure water. And then we know that water moves from pure water to the sucrose containing water side through the semi um, permeable membrane. So um, if you have to use osmotic pressure to explain this movement of water, you have to say water moves from low osmotic pressure to high osmotic pressure. And that doesn't make sense. If you use that as a water potential, um, then um, so pure water has zero, OK? And then sucrose-containing water has some osmotic uh, potential in it coming from the osmotic pressure. And then um, the value is always negative. If you have more salts, more negative. So here you are, um, pure water is zero, and more negative um, uh, 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 water solution or sucrose water solution having more negative water potential. And now water moves from high water potential to low water potential or more negative water potential. So that sort of much easier, straightforward to understand the water movement. Okay, so that's one example. Right, so um, if you have both sides pure water, water doesn't move, right? We know that. But if there is a um, sort of piston, um, you know, the, the force is added, pressure is added, then basically this pressure would try to squeeze water through the membrane, all right? And this move is expressed as, you know, the water movement driven by the um, um, added pressure potential. Pressure potential was added to your water, you know, right-hand side. Therefore, because of the pressure potential, added pressure to the system, the water potential is now positive, okay? Pressure potential is always positive, with targa is also positive. And therefore, this value, water potential, um, is higher than just pure water, which doesn't have any resistance to, to, to move away. So that's why now water moves from B side, you know, the B right hand side to left hand side because of the pressure potential. So here you see that um, right here. Um, so the water potential in the A is zero, um, and then uh, the B has um, pure water osmotic potential, which is zero, and then pressure potential. So basically the positive value. Therefore, if you compare the water potential of A and B, then uh, B is greater, therefore water moves from right-hand side to left-hand side. Very simple, very simple si situation. So if you apply both, you know, sucrose water, which is pulling water, you know, more negative water potential, therefore pulling water from the other side, and the um, uh, pressure potential, which is adding pressure to squeeze um, the water, push the water, pull and po uh, pull. And then you can actually create balanced situation. You know, pure water sitting right next to the sucrose containing water, separated by the semi um, um, uh, transparent membrane. And then if you don't have this pressure potential added to the system, Again, your water moves from pure water to the sucrose water, right? So the, the sucrose water is pulling the water from pure water side. Um, but because of the push coming from the uh, pressure potential, it could achieve the condition having no water movement. And then when you see the water potential exactly the same, so the pure water is zero, and sucrose water has negative osmotic potential, and pressure potential positive and canceling out and create a zero value, then you wouldn't see no you know, 
water molecule going um, uh, between the two systems. All right. So everything, water movement can be explained using water potential. Water potential, osmotic potential, pressure potential, and then also matrix potential. So now, matrix potential. If you have two systems, again, one is uh, matrix system, so the porous system like soil or substrate saturated with water. The other one is pure water. Uh, if water to water with a substrate, there is no movement. But if there is an addition of substrate, porous media there, then there is a matrix potential that's adsorption. So the water is attracted by the, um, by the um, substrate. So therefore, water moves from left to right. And then if you want to uh, think about the water potential, this is zero, right? Pure water has zero water potential. And then right-hand side is um, osmotic potential of pure water, which is zero, and matrix potential, which is negative value. So again, zero to more negative water moves, all right? So everything can be explained. By the way, um, so this water movement by water potential can be explained between the two systems that contain water, either as a liquid or as a vapor, right? So it's, if it is completely dry, for example, if it is completely dry substrate, right, then water doesn't move, okay? So that's why, you know, you, when you have a substrate which is bone dry, then you don't really, it's a hard, you know, it's very hard to get absorbed because there's no water in the system, therefore water doesn't want to move. So you, you really need to have some moisture to get this water movement easily, right? Okay, any question? Okay. Okay, um, plant, so this is a, a, the cell as a model, but you can apply this as a whole plant, but the plant is specialized. Um, you know, targa is specialized. That's why, you know, it's not wilting. If it is not, it will wilt. Um, so the plant cell has uh, water potential, and that water potential is basically um, the sum of the three major um, components. One is osmotic potential of the site soil, so that's uh, the solution, osmotic potential. It's, it's dissolved um, salts, everything in there. Um, and matrix potential of cytoplasm, so that it's a matrix, it's, 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 um, it has some matrix potential, you know, the um, uh, it's kind of porous structure in it. And then the pressure potential, which is targa. Targa is resistance to the, you know, um, uh, uh, the water, because the water is coming constantly from, for example, root or outside um, of the roots. And then pressurizing and turgor is resisting. So um, negative value, osmotic potential, negative value, matrix potential, and positive value, pressure potential, which is turgor. So if you look at the turgor and total water potential and maybe osmotic potential, just ignoring matrix potential, over the time, plants are getting wilt, losing water and getting wilt, wilted. Um, you see this kind of decline. So this is a time, um, uh, and then also you can see that um, uh, gradually, gradually water content declined over time. So that means water is lost, therefore the osmotic pressure is going to increase. So the more concentrated, you know, concentration um, uh, of the salts is, is happening in the um, site soil. So the, this one is um, um, osmotic potential, and this, this one is the targa. Again, osmotic potential is negative value, okay, negative value. And then uh, pressure potential is targa, and which is positive value, usually somewhere between one to four megapascal. Um, and then the sum of those two is the um, water potential plant water potential. And the starting point is what? It's about point something. It's a little bit above or a little bit less than zero. Um, and then um, when you have um, declining water content, 
you have loss of um, actually loss of turga because the, you know the cell is getting smaller and smaller because water is lost, and then the salts are concentrated. Therefore, osmotic potential goes more negative, right? And then um, when the turga reached the zero. That means completely lost the structural force, therefore plants get wilt. And then, as you can see, um, both decline, therefore water potential declines. So by measuring water potential of the plants, you can see that if they are very close to the, you know, um, very close to the wilting point or not. All right? Okay. All right, so... This one, I don't know um, if you learn this too when you learn the water potential, but as I said, moist air has also water potential. Anything, any media, liquid, solid, you know, if there is water molecule in it, you can express that water's chemical potential as water potential. And there is a very simple equation to find the water potential of the air based on the relative humidity. Okay, based on the relative humidity. And as you can see, megapascal, 100% um, saturated air has zero water potential. So they, it's the same as pure water. It's exactly the same as pure water. 100% relative humidity air. And then as humidity goes lower and lower, and then water potential of the air gets more negative, lower and lower, more negative uh, value. So as you can see, 100% zero megapascal, right? And 99.6% humidity, which is near saturation, which has already 0.54 megapascal. 99, 1.36 megapascal, and 96%, uh, 5.51 megapascal. 90% 14.2 megapascal and then 50.0% humidity is minus 93.6 megapascal. Okay, so the plant water potential, the range, well watered, you know, well irrigated plant tissue or whole system water potential is about negative 0.1 megapascal. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the other way, negative one megapascal. That's plant water potential. So you see that huge negativeness in the, in the air. Okay? So that's why, you know, if you, if you put the plants, you know, cut the roots and then put the plants, it just evaporate and will, right? Because the air has such a negative value. So putting all the water attracting from, you know, the, um, uh, like a plant tissue containing more water, therefore um, higher uh, water potential, less negative, right? So, so that view you get, I think, from, oh, not yet, um, from the slide after this. But anyway, so um, one thing you want to um, uh, understand is if there are two um, uh, objects or um, uh, water and something next to each other, in contained environment, in this case, air and solution next to each other in a contained environment, um, you know that evaporation could occur, um, or a water molecule might move from air to the solution, depending on the concentration, but eventually um, reach the equilibrium, right? So, you know, if you contain the uh, pure water in the system, and then, you know, air t make the system airtight, and then leave it, you know, maybe two hours, three hours, then above headspace of the pure water becomes 100%. Because water moves according to the water potential, and then equilibrium, and in this case, um, it's gonna be zero. So the zero um, water potential for the air, that means 100% humidity, right? And then solution, pure water, so zero. So the zero and zero equilibrium, okay? If you are adding um, salt containing water, you know, whatever the salt, sodium chloride or whatever, sucrose, and then having certain water potential, right? And then if headspace is small enough, 
that head space water potential is going to be the same as the solution water potential. Okay, so for example, if the solution water potential is what? 2 megapascal, negative, 2 megapascal. Go back to the previous slide. The humidity above that solution is going to be somewhere between 96% and 99%. You can compute, you know, what's the actual exact um, humidity. But, so even though the contained system, if the water sitting in that is not the pure water, having some water potential, the above air is, is not going to be saturated because of the salt containing, because of the negative water potential in that solution. Okay, equilibrium, All right. Okay, so um, water potential in the air, water potential in the plant system, um, specifically in the leaf, mesophyll cell, or xylem, um, and root cell, and water potential in the soil. This would explain the movement of water from the root zone uh, through the roots, through the stem, through the leaf, to the air, right? So it's a continuum system. And then if you look at the value, it makes sense. Um, so this is actually the soil on the top, but anyway, so the soil, uh, 10 centimeter below, below ground, and uh, a little bit away from the roots. Um, somebody measured that, and then that water potential in the soil, well watered, I, I think, um, um, soil, 0.3 megapascal in this example. Okay, it could be very different value, right? Um, and then adjacent to root, um, 0.5 megapascal, uh, negative 0.5. And xylem, it's about, you know, it's a 0.8. So it's, as I said, plant water potential is about negative 1 megapascal. So in this case, 0.8. So as you can see, um, less negative, more negative, even more negative. So you can see the water moving this way from the roots or the outside of the roots, nearby roots, and then the xylem in the root. And then inside the plant, it's about the same. There might be difference, but difference is quite negligible. And then now the big difference is here. Um, the mesophyll um, uh, here is 0.8, and then um, uh, stomata, um, uh, uh, or inside the stomata, so in stomatal cavity, which is 95% um, uh, relative humidity, near saturation. And then that itself is giving very negative value, point, negative point, no, negative 6.9 megapascal. So you see the big driving forces right here. And then also satura near saturated stomatal cavity and uh, outside stomata, um, ambient humidity level, let's say 60% in this case, that's also a big jump, 6.9 and 70.0. So that's pretty much the driving force, you know, between the leaf and also air. And basically pulling water, you know, to the air. And that pulling force is the driving force of transpiration and water uptake in a tall tree, you know. Otherwise, you, you really cannot pump the water through the plant system to the, that high level because of the big driving force um, between the leaf and air. Um, plants can take up water through the, you know, long distance. All right, and here's a note, hydroponic solution. It's about minus 0.1 megapascal, most of the solution, or less, okay, 0.1 megapascal, negative, or less. So even less negative value than uh, well-watered soil. Um, the soil could dry up, right? You know, rain doesn't happen or irrigation didn't happen. And then usually the permanent wilting point, meaning the, the soil water potential declines because of the lack of water and, you know, concentration of the salts. Um, and then certain point, plants start wilting, losing turgor, and that's usually around 1.5 megapascal, 1.5 megapascal, okay? So in that case, plant, in this case, if the plants have 
negative 0.8 megapascal, and then root zone water potential is negative 1.5. Obviously, root zone has less negative value. Uh, the, the other way, sorry. Um, root zone has more negative value, minus 1.5, than plant tissue, minus 0.8. Therefore, water needs to go from the plant to the soil, right? So the plants are more, even in a condition, driving loss of water, okay? So, so that's why plants get huge stress, water stress, and wilt. All right, um, here, I am simplifying the system just by picking three representative values, soil and plant or leaf, and then air. And then just take a look at the relationship of between those three. And then I, I'm using um, sort of water tank model to understand this um, value and then also the driving force. So this model, the water potential, um, is expressed as the height of the water, okay? And then soil has certain, you know, reserve of water, and plant has certain water content, and the air contains some amount of water, right? And depending on the content, the water potential changes, okay? Um, so the soil has um, uh, uh, more negative water potential, okay? And then this, this um, height is a positive value, but you, you, you kind of understand that as absolute value, so just removing negative value. But anyway, so more negative when the height is greater. Um, so the soil has more negative value. Um, and then, um, not the other way. The other way, the other way. What am I talking about? This is not, this is not correct. Um, let me correct that. This is actually... That's negative, right? All right. Sorry about that. Because otherwise it doesn't go less negative to more negative. Yeah, so when, when the um, value is high, then that means less negative. And then um, if it is pure water, which, which is zero, you know, no substrate, nothing, then zero kilopascal or megapascal. And then um, that water moves uh, from the soil to plants according to the water potential difference. Plants have also certain water potential. That's the height of this tank. And then, um, uh, uh, so that water potential is based on the osmotic potential and then also the pressure potential in the plant system and a little bit of metric potential. So the water moves from um, soil to the plants and there's a resistance, you know, related to the soil or roots or stem or leaf. So that's limiting the water flux. But um, uh, uh, the water moved from soil to the plants basically increased the plant water potential, increased the plant water potential. You know, water moved from soil to the plants, therefore the, the, the le water level goes up. So that means water potential gets less negative, more water in the plant, right? And then um, that dry, the difference between the plant's water potential and air, air water potential is another driving force. And there is the resistance, which is stomatal resistance and boundary layer resistance, which we learned many weeks ago. And if there, there is a height difference, then there is a, you know, the potential big movement from the plants to the air. And then again, um, uh, if there is more um, water lost to the air, then that would uh, go. That would reduce the water potential or make the water potential more negative. So that means water level decline, and that decline create much bigger water potential difference between soil and plant, and that would create bigger driving force for the plants to absorb water. So it's just all continued, and then this uh, model. Um, uh, helps you to understand how water is moved from the soil to the air. All right. And uh, um, this one is the same analogy, 
you know, the electric circuit analogy, but the whole plant system. Now we have um, water potential in the leaf, water potential in the xylem, water potential in the stem, water potential in the root, water potential in the soil, and maybe you can connect one more water potential in the air, and then the whole resistances, you know, resistance through the leaf, through the stem, through the root, and then when it is a steady state conditions, the flux or amount of water moving through the system is the same, so that's why um, uh, evapotranspiration can be expressed either of those um, uh, expressions. So um, the water potential in the soil and water potential in the leaf, and then the whole resistances exist in the system, or just take out one um, uh, in this location here. Um, so the water movement between soil and root so that is the same amount, um, uh, basically, the evaporation or transpiration is the same amount. Therefore, um, you can just express using, um, you can express just using the uh, soil water potential, root water potential divided by uh, soil resistance. The same thing applied to the rest, you know, just looking at here or here or here or here and then express that um, the water flux or evaporation um, uh, or transpiration through the plant um, it, under the steady state conditions, it's all the same, right? Okay, so how how do we measure water potential? Is is this coming um, two or three slides in here? So water potential can be measured um, in multiple ways. Oops, sorry. Um, I just wanted to check something. All right. Uh, water potential can be measured in multiple ways. Um, and then those three, probably not the third one as a common method, but I know um, the first one and second one, widely used um, by researchers. And third one is more... Um, specific purpose, but it's very powerful method. But anyway, so the psychrometer is the water potential measurement based on the enclosure. So that if you have a small cubet and then you have a soil containing um, water, or if you have a section of plant tissue and then close it, and then if that you know, the plant tissue or the soil is occupying most of the space, then equilibrium um, water potential can be measured by measuring head space relative humidity. So by measuring head space relative humidity, you can estimate what was the equilibrium water potential, therefore what is the potential water potential of the measurement um, sample, soil or leaf. So that is pretty well used. The drawback of this system is you have to the soil is no problem, but uh, uh, the tissue and water potential analysis, you have to cut. You have to cut and sample the section put in the chamber so that's not in situ measurement or um, it's an invasive, destructive measurement. Um, pressure chamber, I think I have... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, so pressure chamber is also destructive measurement. Um, uh, but so the whole section of the plant, for example, one stem or one shoot can be in a pressure chamber. And then if you, so this is the magnification of this uh, attachment. And then if you cut the stem, um, you get the water sucked up because of the negative water potential of the plant. If you pressurize the whole, you know, um, surrounding air in a pressure chamber, you get, start seeing the sap coming back at the end of the stem. And then that's the pressure is, you know, so that balanced with the water potential of the plant, you know. That's why water is now coming back to the um, cut surface. And by knowing that, <coughs> you can actually find the water potential of the plants. Okay. Widely used. However, the drawback is you have to cut the plants. So you have to kill the plants. OK? 
Caitlin. The question is if it is widely used, yes. Oh, why? why? Yeah. Because there is no alternative method. To find the whole plant uh, water potential, this is a straightforward method. Um, there is no alternative method. Um, there is a chamber, uh, the um, psychrometric chamber, the, which is the first one, um, applied to a, um, a living plant. But I haven't seen, maybe the technology might have developed, but I haven't seen the accurate measurement of that kind of application. So the soil water potential is pretty much psychrometer, so the contained soil and equilibrium, and then find the equilibrium humidity, therefore estimating water potential of the uh, sample. Um, plant water potential is, I guess, still a pressure chamber is widely used. More microscale water potential measurement is this uh, pressure probe, probe, pressure probe method, um, which is uh, I think there is a, a, a very fine um, microcapillary tube going into the cell, and then you can even measure the cell uh, water potential using that, and then um, uh, uh, cell biologists. Uh, use that. Um, this is not new s method, but relatively old, maybe uh, 80s or 70s. Um, but um, I think researchers still use that to find a very, you know, the micro scale uh, water potential difference. So that this cell and next cell, how much water potential difference, therefore, uh, how much um, potential expansion of the cell, which is growth, right? Uh, the um, increasing volume of the cell. Um, you can actually measure that using this um, uh, pressure probe method. Okay. Phew. Um, this slide is showing two different water pathways uh, in, a, in a plant system. One is what we call symplastic pathway. Yes. How is this probe? Oh. So it's a hairy, I guess, you know. Um, it's very tiny. Okay. I never used. So, yeah, I wish. It's, it's fast. If you look at the papers, it's fascinating um, reports uh, coming out from this application. But it's a very fine system. Um, I know a professor who is using, but never personally used. Okay, um, all right, so the water transport, two pathways. One is symplastic, meaning um, going through um, the uh, intercellular space. Um, uh, no, actually, it, inside, the, inside the cell, sorry, symplastic is inside the cell. So going through the um, membrane, uh, plasma membrane, and through the um, cell, inside the cell, and uh, um, going into the next cell, next cell, next cell, and then going through the cell or the, the, the inside the cells. Um, apoplastic is outside the cell, so the intercellular space, but there is um, uh, what they call Kasparian, Kasparian um, um, yeah, layer or what band. Um, so you have to go at least one time to go around um, in the cell. Um, but uh, um, there are two ways. And then these two pathways um, actually affect the um, transportation of iron, uh, ions and then also a sugar, and then we come back to the pathways um, on Wednesday. All right. And then also, um, in the plasma uh, membrane, we know that there is a water-specific channel, which is the gate for water. I, I think you learn now in the plant physiology, um, uh, introduction of plant physiology. Um, so I think when I was undergraduate student, we didn't know water channel. Um, I think it was a quite relatively new, um, I guess. Um, so now, but, but I think all the undergraduate students um, probably learn this. But anyway, so it's, it's actually active water transportation um, relative to, uh, compared to more passive water transportation based on the water potential difference. 
um, channel open and um, close. Um, and uh, uh, under certain conditions, uh, water channels, aquaplanes, um, close, and therefore plants cannot take up um, water fast enough and then make the plants wilt. Um, and then one of the example I know um, uh, uh, as a condition causing closing aquaplanes is uh, uh, temperature low temperature and then uh, aquaplanes are not functioning. Therefore, water movement uh, across the um, plasma membrane is reduced. Uh, therefore, plants wilt. And that's this example. So the low temperature and uh, uh, more mild temperature uh, or different species. I, I guess this is a different species response under the same temperature. This is a um, uh, mask melon, which is very sensitive to low temperature, and this is a squash, which is very uh, resistant to low temperature. And then the first symptom you see, the sensitive plants and non-sensitive plants to the low temperature is wilting. You don't see any, you know, um, uh, necrosis and stuff like that, dead tissue, but you see wilting as a first symptom. Under the, under the low temperature. And why? Because water uptake from the roots are, are not uh, working in the same way as under the uh, warm temperature. So that's why you see wilting. Water is not taken up. Um, and then people work on aquaplanes function under chilling temperature because that is involved. Uh, we believe that um, those are involved. Uh, so so the, the chilling Sensitive plants tend to uh, close the aquaplanes, the channels, rather quickly than um, chilling tolerant plants, which can still open um, the plants, um, or no, <laughs> open the, uh, the aquaplanes um, so the water is coming up. So we did a quite interesting experiment some time ago. Um, so my students were um, working on grafting and rootstock, we had two rootstocks. One is very sensitive to low temperature. The other one is very tolerant to um, low temperature. And then um, the scion, which is the top part, is the same, you know, the uh, genotype, grafted on the sensitive um, uh, rootstock and non-sensitive rootstock. And then, of course, sensitive one wilted, and non-sensitive one to the temperature didn't wilt. And that also is explained, we didn't go further, but probably explained by water movement. Yes? Those are the citrus plants? No, those are uh, cucurbit plants. Actually, those pictures are part of that experiment. We had uh, mask melon as a, as a scion, and rootstock, a squash, or also mask melon rootstock. And when grafted on mask melon, mask melon plants wilted. Mask melon grafted on squash w didn't wilt. Even though you know, non-grafted musk melon cannot survive that low temperature, but if grafted on squash, because squash still you know, pump up water to the scion and uh, uh, prevent that wilting. So it was quite interesting, you know, the simple physiological um, observation, but explained with the water transportation from the roots. All right. OK. <clears throat> Okay, uh, and okay, so this one is um, explaining, what was that? Absorption of water and internal pressure. So uh, water absorption, um, so, so I think this is, hold on a second, what was that? Um, oh, yeah, 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 so, so when plants are actively transpiring, so as I said, there is a pulling force from the leaf. You know, leaf to air is a big driving force in terms of water potential difference. So there's a huge pulling. So water is rather dragged into the water, uh, dragged into the plant system from the root, from the roots, right? So there's not actively pushing. Um, so there's always pull and push push from the, you know, the substrate or root system, um, and then pull between the leaf and air. And then under different conditions, the magnitude of pull and push 
it's going to be different. For example, when plants are actively transpiring, pull is much bigger than push. Um, when plants are not transpiring, push is going to be significant. Therefore, you might start seeing something like gutation. You know, the, um, when transpiration is not going, maybe high humidity uh, condition, but still pushing coming because of there is a, you know, also the um, water potential difference between the root zone and roots, right? Plants negative 1.0 megapascal, the root, root zone um, negative 0.1 or 0.3, so less negative to more negative water try to get in. So that's the root pressure push. And if that push is significant, and then not much pull is going on under the condition which close the stomata, then pressurize and then even squeeze the water from the xylem through the exit called hydrosols, um, gutation. So that, um, I explained this last week, Wednesday, to those students uh, who were with me in the greenhouse to see the uh, strawberry. But uh, gutation is a, a, a um, it's not the condensation of the water from the air. It's a, it's a xylem sap squeezed from the plant. So there is a hydrosol. This is a pore at the end of the xylem. And then when xylem is pressurized, when push is much, you know, uh, dominating than pull, and then in that case, you, t you start seeing this gutation. Okay, so it's a, a good indicator in certain species like st strawberry to see the big, you know, pressure xylem pressure. And uh, we know that gutation is a good sign, and then also that big pressure um, is a good transportation mechanism for the calcium transport. Okay, so the calcium transportation in the plant, if you remember from the last Monday, last week, um, is driven by mass flow. Calcium is driven by mass flow. So the, that pressure, xylem pressure, to move the water through the system is also the driving force of the calcium transportation. Okay, so when plants are under relatively negative xylem pressure or not enough positive pressure in the xylem, you might see calcium deficiency and you might see tip burn. So I'm going to explain the strawberry issue we had in, in the context of gutation, high pressure, water potential, root, you know, pressure, push and pull, okay? Um, okay, so the strawberry project we started several years ago um, because strawberry is one of the widely um, grown crops in greenhouse, but I haven't seen much activities in commercial side as well as academic side strawberry production research. So six years ago, I think, we decided to test in a small scale strawberry production. And the goal is try to you know, get ourselves used to the strawberry and identify the issues we can you know, pick up as a research project. But uh, um, first year, we noticed this huge issue of tip bands. We couldn't get rid of that, the tip band everywhere. So here, here it is. Uh, it starts in the shoot tip. Okay, it starts in the shoot tip, and then you see the slightly dark color of shoot tip, and then that develops into leaf like this and having the tip um, necrosis. Okay, and then uh, um, uh, deform the leaf, right? But it's not probably so much an issue, but the big issue of uh, tip burn in strawberry is more in the calyx side. So you can see that, uh, you know, brown, burn, calyx. So this is obviously reduced the market quality of the strawberry fruit, right? Nobody wants to purchase strawberry having brown calyx. They want to have nice green flesh calyx. So um, we started thinking about, you know, calcium deficiency. So we applied foliar calcium spray, hoping that calcium can penetrate to the tissue. But it's really not the leaf, it's a, it's a, it's a meristem inside, inside the shoot tip. So really calcium spray doesn't really solve the issue um, at all. 
Um, so I started looking up, you know, what would be the other way to solve this issue. And then we came up with this idea and then supported by other literatures telling that gutation, root pressure, um, you know, when root pressure happens, the humidity needs to be this high. Otherwise, it doesn't. So we took a look, you know, close look to our humidity condition. Daytime, it's always low, right? You never have high saturation humidity in the daytime in this climate. But nighttime could be potential. You know, transpiration is not occurring much. Okay, so the leaves, stomata are closed, but still from the surface, um, very small amount of transpiration, water loss is happening from the leaf. If the humidity is high enough that suppress completely the transpiration, that means pour, you know, water pour from the leaf to the air, that pulling force is probably disappear or very much disappeared almost under high humidity. In that case, root pressure can dominate and then having that gutation. So the, so the literature was saying, 1979, the critical BPD in the air to see strawberry gutation is 0.1 kilopascal or less. And 0.1 kilopascal is um, about 90% or higher. Then you get 0.1 kilopascal BPD. Okay, so we looked at the greenhouse humidity level you know, the uh, standard conditions, and then we realize that humidity is only 80%, 70%, and BPD-wise, it's always, the lowest is 0.25, or uh, uh, sometimes two, or three, um, it's never get to that small BPD, or the high enough humidity. So what we did, you know, and then we, of course, never seeing gutation in my strawberry plants. And the strawberries are always having a high percent um, tip burn and calyx burn. So the first thing we did was covering the plants during the night to create high humidity during the night. So they're using the low cover plastic film. Somebody went out to greenhouse at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, you know, remove the plastic material and then create a very low uh, BPD or high humidity uh, in that in that microclimate, and then we successfully. So the next day, when we came out to the greenhouse and removed the cover, the plants showing gutation all over, and then you can even tell plants are happy, you know, saying thank you to me, you know, covering up and high humidity, nice. But anyway, so in, within two weeks, we started seeing the, the big difference in terms of calyx band and tip band. We almost, you know, lower the uh, tip band and calyx band to the negligible or minor level with covering. But covering is not really, you know, practical uh, application. So we did uh, initially covering every night. This is a morning picture, obviously, but we moved to the movable curtain to create a high humidity inside. And then now we are doing under bench misting system to humidify entire greenhouse by doing that. And then now we are looking at the, the minimum duration. Um, we are now three hours as a target and look, looks like three hours of high humidity and then let them dry out. Works really well to supply enough calcium by positive xylem pressure. Um, um, and then I want to apply this to uh, some other crop um, which have also known uh, problem of tip burn. But anyway, so, so that's one example uh, or pressurized xylem because of the root pressure coming from the water potential difference between roots and uh, substrate um, dominating compared to the pore, which is the water potential difference between leaf tissue and air. Okay, all right. Um, water movement in the um, controlled environment crop production uh, is involved many other disorders, um, not just tip burn. Um, and another, another good example is brassam and rot, um, which is um, also reduced water flask going, going into the fruit 
therefore calcium deficiency in the fruit because big transpiration going on through the leaf and then allocation to the fruit is limited. So that's also, you know, uh, water relation um, related um, uh, disease or disorder of the plants. Another example is fruit cracking. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you are working with um, teaching greenhouse, if you have um, cracking issue. Do you have cracking issue? You have more brassam and now? Yes. Uh, is, is that also caused by um, high humidity levels of brassam and if it is very, very high and then overall transpiration is reduced, I think brassam and could happen. But in these conditions, more with low humidity and high radiation or the salt accumulation. Yeah, 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 high temperature, yes. High temperature, high temperature brings the saturation point much bigger, right? So that bringing BPD much higher. So that the same as low humidity. No, the high humidity during the daytime caused tip burn. High humidity during the nighttime reduced the tip burn. Yeah, so it's a pull and, you know, if you understand pull and push, so the high, during the day you have a big pull, right, transpiration. If it is reduced, allocation is going to be lowered too. So anyway, so um, I'm running out of time today, so I'm going to go back come back to this point, we, talk, we start probably talking about fruit cracking and probably I, I put one more slide to review the um, blossom and rot issue relative to the water movement in the system and then finish up this um, before uh, talking about uh, sugar translocation sink source. All right. <laughs>